I mean, it wasn't bad, bad. It was just, I wanted more. I, I was reaching for more than I got. <laughs> so good morning, everybody. I've been waiting just a few minutes um, before we got started because people are continuing to filter in and I'm expecting we'll be filtering in um, really for the next two hours. So welcome to Columbia University. Welcome to the Journalism School. Um, we've got an absolutely gorgeous day today, so thank you all very much for taking the time to come up. Um, I am also going to welcome people who are on what we had thought was going to be a live stream, but what I now believe will be a video. Uh, there are people from all over the world and all over the United States who are also participating. Um, for those of you who are at a distance, it's possible to type in questions. There's a little bit of a problem with the live stream, but we understand that the chat is working, so you can go ahead and type your questions in for our panelists as we go along with the program, and we will have one of our staff members ask them on your behalf. Obviously, all of those of you who are here in person, we'd like to make this a conversation, um, so please feel free. We'll stop at various points for questions, start thinking about any questions that you might have. Um, we're eager to talk with you and to respond to your questions. We've got a really wonderful day lined up. Um, and I say a day, normally we do a two-hour information session, but today happens to be our documentary festival, which happens once a year. Last night, our documentary students graduated right here in this room um, in a wonderful ceremony. And today, all day long, they are showing their films, the documentary films, which are their final master's projects. Their families are all here. Their friends are all here. So once we're finished um, today, you are also invited to just go straight down the hall uh, to the Jamail le Lecture Hall. And you can stay as long as you like. They will have, um, of course, themselves as the directors and producers of the films. There will also be people who are in the films. Um, and as we show each film at the end, there's then a small discussion afterwards. So especially for those of you who might be interested in documentary, visual craft, that sort of thing, we invite you to join us and see what, see what goes on live here. I also um, just wanted to mention that we will have faculty, students, talking. Uh, my colleague Gina Bubion will be here from career development um, and we will also be um, introdu talking about admissions and financial aid and throughout all of this as I said we'll be happy to answer your questions. I should also introduce myself. I'm Christine Souders. I'm the Associate Dean for Admission and Financial Aid and um, Again, I welcome you. I also welcome you on behalf of Dean Steve Cole, who is ill today and sends his greetings as well as his regrets. He likes to come and speak at these things. We were expecting that he would be coming in and sticking his head in as a part of the documentary festival, but unfortunately, he's not able to be here. Um, I am also not Taryn Almanzar, who is listed um, for as the speaker right now. Taryn is in the back. She's losing her voice, as are many people here. Um, so um, I am stepping in and doing my very best in imitation of Taryn. Um, my colleague David Hooker, who is in the front, many of you know already because you've either corresponded with him, spoken with him on the telephone, um, 
or met him in one way or another. And if you've been here to sit in on a class, it's very likely that David has either arranged that for you or has been one of the people who has taken you in to the classroom and introduced you to the professor. Um, there will be other of the admission and financial aid staff who will be coming in and out this morning, and I'll introduce you to them um, as they show up. Um, I feel like there's a piece that I'm leaving out here. The application deadlines, and I'll say this a number of times, the Master of Science in Journalism, the Master of Science in Data Journalism, and the doctoral program all have admissions application deadlines coming up December 15th. So we look forward to receiving those applications. The Master of Arts application deadline is January 6th, and the dual Master of Science in Computer Science and Journalism application deadline is December, or excuse me, January 15th. So keep all of those in mind. Those dates are all up on the website as well. And you can always call and ask us or email us um, or text us or communicate with us in one way or another if you've got questions about it. We've also got a scholarship application deadline that is coming up that is the 15th of January as well. So a number of dates to, to keep in mind um, and we'll continue to remind you. So with that, I'd like to get started. Um, I'm going to invite my faculty panel to introduce themselves. I've already had a slight conversation with them about um, things that they're going to talk with you about. Um, but I would like to introduce Elena Cabral, Dale Maharaj, Elisa Solomon, and I'm going to have them talk with you about um, the programs that they work in, the kinds of work that they do. They'll describe a little bit for you uh, about who they are as journalists, how they got to where they are as journalists. Um, and so, Elena, take it away. Hi, my name is Elena Cabral, and I'm the director of the part-time program, and I'm also a graduate of the part-time program. It's a very unique experience. Um, to do the MS degree over a period of two years versus 10 months. This is a way for students who work and live in New York City to do this program um, over the course of six semesters, a summer, fall, and spring, and a summer, fall, and spring, and, and really do the same requirements as the full-time MS degree. Um, and what the uh, part-time program offers is uh, a flexibility um, to stretch out these classes over a period of time. But I always find it necessary to say that it's not a night school, you know, that uh, just as you see the documentary program going on uh, currently, uh, there are lots of experiences in this building, uh, lectures and workshops and the like that happen, um, you know, all day, uh, every day, and that our MS students, both full-time and part-time, are invited to participate in. Also, if you're someone who's interested in video or audio, um, that those are uh, concentrations, if you will, that require a lot um, of day uh, daytime hours just to shoot video, for example, or to edit and mix uh, audio. So those in those areas, it does require a little more flexibility. But I think this is an ideal program for someone who um, has some flexibility at work, has been working for a while, understands New York City, has a passion for storytelling, and really wants to do a program like this while holding on to that job. Um, I graduated myself in 1999, went on to work for the Miami Herald, have come back, uh, came back to New York, and uh, connected with mentors of mine who very much still advise me um, on everything from teaching about social media to uh, book writing. And so this is very much an intellectual home for me as it would be as it becomes for everyone who comes through those doors and becomes part of this professional family for the rest of their working life. And um, 
So I'm really happy that uh, Professor Maharaj is here to talk about the full-time MS program. Um, and I will uh, be, I've been actually fielding quite a few questions already about the uh, part-time option. When you go to the website and you click on programs, click on MS, you'll see that there are two options, full-time and part-time. Click on the part-time link and take a look at the video that we have featured there of one of our grads from 2011, Vladimir Dutier, who um, went on to become a uh, CBS national correspondent and an anchor. And um, his story is quite extraordinary, and it shows so very much what's possible uh, through you know this program. Thanks. And I'm, I'm Dale Maharaj. Um, I teach um, long-form narrative journalism. I've um, published 12 books. I just sold my 12th. Hard to believe. Um, I'm that old. Um, and it's, I also I did my first podcast this last year. Oh, cool. Yeah, journalism's changing. And uh, I incorporate that into my classes. In the spring, I teach um, a social issues course. And this year, I'm do just doing something very different. Professor Joanne Farian, uh, who's a new faculty member, she has a, a top 20 rated iTunes podcast that was just named top 20 of the year. Uh, and I just won another award. She's teaching a long form podcast course and we're going to intersect our courses. My narrative long form social issues, which is very, the very broad umbrella of topics. Uh, we're gonna intersect our classes where some of her students will learn my long form techniques and my students will learn the, the podcast techniques. Uh, I'm very excited about journalism right now, and especially in the podcasting realm. My uh, podcast was called The Dead Drink First. It was uh, an Audible, and it was top, I, I can't believe this myself, it was top rated in all categories on Audible for three weeks. Uh, it's like uh, uh, I'm an overnight success at 60-some years old, and I'm not going to say how many 60-some years old. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, it was really f difficult to do and very fun to do. Uh, my producer is a graduate of this program, Emily Martinez. Uh, she's like 27 or 28, and she's a big wheel producer, and she's amazing to work with. Uh, I just, uh, she also did Beth Macy's podcast uh, that's just kid dropped. And Beth and I, I just had dinner with Beth the other night. We call ourselves her children. <laughs> she's so good. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, uh, and I'm teaching a course right now called First Person Immersion, which is social issues based. And it's reporting where the reporter puts themselves in the story, but not in a me, me, look at me, how, you know, how cool I am way, but in a way that reveals uh, character, very special kinds of stories one does for that, which also lends to podcasting. Podcasting, by nature, radio is very intimate. Um, I also teach the basic journalism course, which everyone has to go through. Uh, it's the boot camp course. We still, us old farts, call it the boot camp course. Mm -hmm. uh, it's seven in very intense weeks of reporting in the streets of New York City. We all have our different ways of teaching it. I'm real old school. Uh, I, I like to say if the journalism school were a church, I'm, that's the evangelical wing of the, of the program. Uh, cover, you cover cops, courts, uh, uh, I, you put you through the paces, you'll never get edited so, so much, but you'll learn how to be a good reporter. And if you're already a reporter, which many of you probably are, you'll become a better reporter. Um, uh, I always like, I don't, I don't, one size does not fit all in my classroom. I, I think my colleagues, most of my colleagues would agree with this. I triage. Somebody has three or four years experience, uh, I'm going to push the bar higher on them. If somebody's brand new, uh, I'm going to, uh, you know, understand that. I'm not, you, don't worry if you don't have any experience. I think one of the fears I think students have coming here is, oh my God, I'm playing in this big, big, big ocean and I'm just a little little minnow. Uh, but a lot of my little minnows have gone on to do very well. My very first class in this school when I first taught here in 1991, I had Greg Jaffe, uh, who's out at the Washington Post. He um, came from a food bank, ran a food bank for seven years. Mm -hmm. Then he uh, um, um, uh, graduated from here, went to Montgomery, Alabama, and was a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize for an expose on the Southern Poverty Law Center a year after he graduated. Uh, and that's continued the whole, wow. I have 1,500 students by my estimate, former students, uh, between here and Stanford. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a very intimate teaching place. I have 1,500 students, but it isn't like uh, a lecture hall. You, you, if you go into undergrad and you go into those halls with 500 people, you know, those professors have 10,000 students, but they don't know them. 
Here we get to know you. We edit you one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, uh, it's uh, very uh, thorough. Uh, those 1,500 students, I can't swear I would tell you all their names, but I'm in touch with many of them. And uh, I'm old enough now that my, my friends either have died or burned out, and most of my for current friends are former students. So um, I'll answer more in the Q&A about the MS program when we get to that point. I'll turn it over to Elisa Solomon. Okay, thanks. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Elisa Solomon. I teach here in the MS and the MA programs, and um, I'm going to talk mostly right now about the MA program. Um, how many of you are thinking about the MA program? Just curious about that. Okay, great. So um, you can direct your questions to me when we get get to that point. So the MS program, is, as you as you heard, focuses on the on the, the, the skills and the art, I would say, of um, reporting and um, storytelling in various media. Um, and the MA program is for students who already have those skills, um, who already are confident that they can go out, um, report a multi-source complicated story, um, and put it across in a clear way, whether in print or audio um, or what have you. They already know how to do that um, by virtue of maybe having done something like an MS program before or by virtue of having worked from, for some years um, in a usually professional capacity, but not necessarily. Um, our concern is less about how many years you've worked professionally and more about what kind of work have you done. Um, so if, you know, what you've done, you've had some experience, and what you've done is some single source Q and A, 400 word stories, and lots of them for some website. Um, the MS is the right program for you because you haven't done complex stories with multiple sources and so on. But if you have, and what you want to do is study the subject matter that you're most interested in writing about, so that you have more expertise, more. Um, uh, intellectual um, and knowledge-based um, um, virtuosity, let's say, and, and nimbleness um, so that you can do deeper reporting on uh, the subject areas you're interested in. Then the MA is the one, the program that um, we would encourage you to look at. Um, I came here when the MA program started, which was in the fall of 2005. Um, until that point, I had been both teaching at the City University um, in theater studies and the PhD program in theater studies. That's what my own background is in. Um, also, I was teaching undergraduate journalism and sometimes the Shakespeare course. Um, and I also had been for 20 years, 21 years, a staff writer at the Village Voice, uh, the late lamented now, um, where I began as a theater critic because that was my, my training and academic background, but I was always interested in everything. And one of the great things about being journalists, of course, is that um, we're curious about everything and we have the privilege of just sort of calling up anyone or knocking on the door of anyone, an expert in any field, and asking them questions. It's just, you just learning things all the time. And at The Voice, I became the immigration policy reporter. Um, I covered queer activism. Uh, I covered Israel-Palestine, traveled there about nine times over the course of my uh, staff writer years to, to cover things there. Um, I covered women's basketball. Uh, I was kind of, you know, all over the place. But the, the consistent thing for me was was writing about um, theater and, and culture more generally. And when I uh, moved to Columbia with the beginning of the MA program in 2005, it was to, to, um, to teach in and to help shape the arts and culture concentration, which is one of four concentrations in the MA program, the others being business and economics, politics, and science. Um, and what happens in the MA program is that you take a, what I think of as the sort of anchoring year-long seminar in your major, um, where you meet twice a week, three hours at a time, with your cohort in whatever your major is, um, where you're studying subject matter, usually through um, conceptual ideas, uh, in a way that helps your journalism get better. So you may be reading scholarly material, but you're reading it in a way that's going to help you uh, unpack concepts that you might then be able to deploy when, when you're writing about 
um, writing about a related issue. You also take over the course of the year three electives, graduate re level electives outside of the journalism school that can help build your specialty. So those could be, depending on your, on your concentration, those could be courses in School of Public Affairs, for example, if you're in the politics uh, major, or in art history or film studies, um, or in cultural anthropology, or in the sciences, um, what have you, depending on your concentration. And this is one of the things that really distinguishes our MA program from, I think, any other program in the country, which is the opportunity to take advantage of this, this incredible wealth of um, scholarship and great professors elsewhere on the campus. Um, people often ask, do I, especially about the business and the science concentrations, do I already have to have a lot of background in business economics or in science for those concentrations? The answer is no. Um, what you have to have is interest and great intellectual curiosity and the eagerness to learn about those subjects. But the, the, the point is to learn about those subjects. And we have a really strong faculty in um, those concentrations, and if I may say in all the concentrations, who are going to um, help you learn about those areas. And, and like Dale said, um, I think all of us, you know, we, we work with each student in a very close and individual way. And from where, wherever you are when, we, when you come in, we push you from there. Um, that's our job, you know, push, push you up some notches from wherever you are. So if you come in without a lot of experience and, you know, you need to get to here, great, that's, that's what we're going to do. If you come in um, uh, already with a lot of experience, you know, there's farther to go, which is uh, why we're here to help, help you. And um, there's lots more to say about thesis and so on, but I think I should stop now and be happy to answer questions. I'm just going to mention very quickly, too, um, there will be student panelists who will be talking about visual craft, broadcast, the data program, that sort of thing, so that um, if you've got some specific questions about those that we're not able to answer here, the students will be here to answer those as well. Um, if you've got a question, um, David is adjusting the microphone. and. He, He's gonna, you can, you can tip it up or down depending on how tall you are um, so that everybody else can hear your question and so that the people who will be listening on the live stream or the video will also hear your questions. Also, we did a um, really terrific webinar with part-time students who aren't always it's easy to uh, get here on a Saturday. Um, they uh, run the gamut from recent grads to people in their um, 40s and 50s with families, you know, who are doing this degree, among other things that they juggle. And that in that discussion, which you can find online, right, Ross, the link is available to all applicants. Uh, you can get a really good sense from that conversation about how they juggle work, family, school, and a lot of other things as well. Um, so I invite you to take a look at that. And I think, Ross, we sent that out last night, is that right? Yeah, so if you want to take a look, we sent out links to a number of the videos and um, webinars that we've done over the fall s semester so that you can take a look at those. So can I, sorry. Yes, Chris, please, Elisa. Well, since nobody's lining up at the mic yet, don't be shy. Um, I can jump in and say something about the thesis project. Absolutely. Okay. So. Um, both MS students and MA students write uh, or produce um, in their uh, appropriate medium um, capstone project. And for MS students, it's um, usually about a 5,000 word uh, story. Um, and, you, and, and in both degree programs, you have an advisor, advisor slash editor, uh, faculty member who works with you very, very closely. Um, even to the point of I sit down and do a line by line, like read the piece aloud, line edit uh, with each of my advisees uh, at the end after we've been meeting, you know, pretty much weekly all year long. In the MA program, um, it's called a thesis, and that's that's for I think uh, state accreditation. You have to <laughs> to have an MA, you have to have a thesis, um, but it's not an academic paper. 
It's not an academic report. Um, and that word thesis sometimes confuses people. It's, it's a work of long form narrative journalism. And it's a really exciting experience for students because it's such a huge challenge for most uh, people in a good way. Um, it's an 8,000 word story whose goal is to marry um, the techniques of narrative, storytelling that's sustained for, you know, over, whoops, over uh, that long a space with analytical ideas. That is, it, you know, if you're writing a story that long, um, it needs to be about something pretty consequential. And so what is that pretty consequential thing and how are you uh, developing that it, as you're uh, delivering it through storytelling with characters, real people. Um, and these, um, they're, they've been really great experiences for students. I can give you some examples of the kinds of things um, students have done. Um, let's see, uh, I, I advised one last year on how um, reggaeton had the, how Medellin in Colombia had been become the kind of new capital of reggaeton and how that helped um, revive the city after the, the years of um, it being a, a drug center, basically. Um, uh, there's a really interesting thesis in the works on eco-saboteurs. Um, there was one some years ago in the business concentration on the um, economic bubble of Ramallah in Palestine. Um, there was one about the development of an underground park in lower Manhattan. Um, there was one about artists on a death row prison in Tennessee. Um, there was one last year, a great one on the on crystals and the vogue for crystals um, in the U.S. Uh, and where they came, where they were mined, under what conditions, um, and uh, the terrible conditions under which they were mined and where they came from. Um, those are just some quick examples. As you maybe heard, not all of those were based in New York City. And there's actually funding you can apply for as an MA student to do reporting outside of New York. Um, and uh, we've sent students pretty much all over the world and other parts of the U.S. to work on those stories. Yeah. The MS is a little different. You have to stick closer to home because there's not funding and it's a whole different setup. But the, you would cover the, uh, generally New York City, although I've had some students do some stories elsewhere, but rarely. Uh, again, a lot of publication. I edit my students with the goal uh, of publishing and pitching is part of the process in, in my uh, edits. Uh, I want uh, students to pick a target publication. Uh, there's a, a site called Narratively here in the city that's published a lot of my students' work. Uh, really, really a good long form site, very prestigious. Lo it's one of those low pay but high prestige places. But I've had students publish in The Atavist. Some of their projects have gone on to become books or, or uh, let's see, uh, uh, Harper's Magazine, um, uh, uh, everywhere. I mean, the New, New Republic, uh, Guardian Long Form, a lot of Guardian Long Form uh, pieces. The Guardian U.S. buys uh, uh, long form features. And uh, New York City is a per perennial uh, favorite of the editor there. Uh, so, um, uh, but again, publication is in mind as I'm working with students. Uh, and it, you write in a different voice for different publications. I, I like to say that magazines are the editor's medium and <laughs> books are the writer's medium. Uh, podcasts, to a degree, are the writer's medium. Uh, but having said that, even though it's the editor's medium, you're, you're, you know, you're going to be writing in a long-form voice. It'll just be t t uh, tailored to the publication. Uh, I miss the old Village Voice. They were very liberal on, on voice. The voice was liberal on voice. Okay. Uh, you could write in a in a different uh, manner uh, and and get published there. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's a little bit about the um, the MS uh, 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 project. Mm -hmm. Come on, and guys. Maybe we could say yeah. something about the MS curriculum more generally too. So uh, you heard about uh, reporting and a little bit about some of the uh, electives that that you teach. Um, uh, students take you know are grounded in that boot camp reporting course in the in the fall and then choose um, among 
options in um, the printed word and in multimedia and then the spring workshops. I teach a course in the spring called Covering Issues of Gender and Sexuality, for example. Um, and, you know, Sam there's, Friedman's book writing there's course. a book writing course. There's Ari, Ari Goldman's um, religion course. There's a religion coverage course. There's an environmental reporting course. I and mean, there's a lot of a lot of chance in this, especially in the spring, for you to choose electives around the areas in the MS program that you're particularly interested in. We have Here some, we go. Some customers, yeah. okay. some questions. That's great. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Ari. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, my question is concerning the MA program. Um, one of the things that attracts me to that program is the opportunity to take courses in the other graduate mm -hmm. schools in Columbia. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if there are any restrictions on that. So, are you allowed to take classes in, say, the law school or some of the other professional schools? And can you also take um, sort of MS selective classes? Okay. So, um, thanks for your question, Ari. Um, the, the short answer is yes and no. <laughs> um, so like the journalism school, um, uh, particularly in the professional schools, a number of the courses are in fact restricted to students in those programs. So you know, when you're in an MA um, seminar here, no one else is in that class. It's only for MA students at the journalism school. And there are classes like that in SEPA, uh, School of International Public Affairs, in the Architecture School, in the School of the Arts, um, and in the law school, um, business school. That's definitely the case for a number of their courses, but not for all their courses. So um, if you uh, choose well, or, or often what will happen is a course will be, uh, um, priority will be given to the students in that school, but then if there's slots, they can open up. And so that's a matter of um, being in touch with the professor early on. That happens a lot in the School of the Arts, for example. Um, I've had students in the arts and culture concentration take international uh, intellectual property classes in the law school, for example. So it's known to happen, um, but sometimes it takes a little uh, finagling. As for can you take MS um, courses, there's a few designated MS courses that MA students can take if there's room after MS students have taken it and if you have the approval of the professor teaching that class and of your seminar professor or, or that your concentration professor. Because you know, the whole point of the MA program is to build your expertise in subject area. And so if you want to take a course in you know, writing a profile or um, uh, audio techniques or something like that, then those aren't MA courses. Um, though you do have a chance to take some skills workshops in the fall in photography, audio, uh, investigative techniques, and data, and some things like that. Um, but if you wanted to take the, I, I think Sam Friedman sometimes allows MA students in the book writing course, my gender and sexuality course I've had MA students, um, um, because it's a content-based one, Jelani Cobb teaches a covering race course. Um, that has allowed MA students, you know, again, if it, if it meets what it is they're trying to study and learn about. But the, the more skills-oriented courses, no. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. A little shorter. Um, my name's Ava. I was wondering if you feel like the curriculum has changed or your approach to teaching has changed given current hostility towards journalists? Could you speak to that a little bit? Wow. <laughs> um, we have a lot of international students in the program and they operate under, Ava, under much different circumstances. They're going back to literally hostile where they're going to get shot, although in this country we had that happen already, sadly. Um, mm -hmm. I think I haven't really changed in terms of, I, I believe in the pursuit of truth uh, and revealing people's stories. I, I like to think in terms of, I, I'm, I'm a very much of a ground reporter. You, you look at my work, I'm on the street talking to people. That hasn't changed. You, you, we listen, that's our job, is to listen. And sure, there's gonna be hostility out there when you, when you go out to report, uh, but if you're listening, people, 99.9% .9 of people, if you're not in a bar and they're not drunk, <laughs> They'll, you'll, they'll deal with you, and you're not going to be in danger in this country of getting killed most, in most cases, uh, depending on the story. Um, but I'm not sure if that answers your question. You have some? Yeah, I, 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 can, I can add to that, and, and Alina, probably you can too. And, um, 
So I think the core principles of reporting and, and abiding by journalistic professional standards and ethics don't change. Um, and in fact, if anything, they're more important than ever. And one of the things that distinguishes is somebody who's, you know, uh, pursuing journalism in a professional way from somebody who's just blogging or being, I, not just, I mean, so there's some great blogging, but who's, who's um, being a pundit or um, expressing their opinion is that we do abide by those standards and we do seek truth. I mean, even as we understand how slippery a term that is, it's what we're trying to do, and we're, we're trying to be as thorough and accurate and fair um, as we can possibly be, and I think under the present circumstances, um, that's all the more important. Like, it's never not been important, but um, the more transparent and um, principled we can be, the better. So we talk about that a lot, and there's an ethics course and a law course um, that all MS students take, and then there's a, a kind of workshop on some of those um, issues for MA students as well. That and but these things come up in every course. And then meanwhile, every day of the week, there are visitors to this school from all over the professional journalistic world, um, which is like. If you just went to those <laughs> without going to class, you'd get an amazing, not that you should skip class, but you'd get an amazing um, education. And among those, we've had um, people coming in to talk about security issues for journalists. Like there's workshops on that that, um, that you would have access to. Yeah. Alina? No, I think uh, uh, Alisa said it up perfectly. And you know, one of the reasons that reporting, the class reporting was sort of, uh, became its own um, course, the very first course that you take, is because we felt as a faculty that that really needed a very in-depth focus from everything um, uh, related to news gathering, interviewing uh, strangers on the street, to uh, looking at uh, documents online, to looking at social media, and, and possessing the tools to be able to identify fake news, fake photographs, and um, particularly in the interviewing, you know, we were all sort of shaking our heads during this uh, uh, now famous press conference where a reporter asked uh, Nancy Pelosi a question that was really not a question, but just a way to, prov to provoke her. And I remember thinking, none of my students would get away with, it, with, asking, a, with asking a question like that because um, this, stand, this very high standard that Elisa speaks um, about is drilled into you from the very first day that you're here, you know, and these are standards that you see broken all the time in um, in media, on you know, network television in particular, and you know, um, I I tell my students, you know, you're going to go out into a world where those rules are broken all the time, but remember your mother's advice and heed my advice too, uh, which is that just because everybody's doing it doesn't make it right. And when we send our students out into the world, they are recognized for that high standard. Mm -hmm. And I think also that, you know, as, as Elena mentioned and, and Dale too, that, you know, anybody who comes to this school becomes part of an enormous community of journalists. And that spirit is very much related to this idea. I think our students understand that the way each of us behaves affects um, our colleagues. I mean, not, not just from the J school, but our colleagues everywhere. You know, one, one journalist who does something sleazy affects the reputation of all journalists. And I, I think uh, students here carry, understand and carry that responsibility to each other. I would also mention that the DART Center is here at Columbia Journalism School. This is a center that works with journalists on how to deal with trauma and death and the dangers that they come up against in doing their work. Um, they provide workshops on as much as possible how to report safely. Um, and they contribute in many, many different ways to the life of the school. So there are a lot of resources that are right here that can help you um, deal with some of those kinds of issues. Please. Hi, my name is Ben. Um, so I have two questions. The first one would be, um, 
how, for, especially for the MS program, are students encouraged to pitch the stories that they write in class to publications in the city? Um, that would be my first one. And then the second one would be, um, I know none of you have said that you're part of the like stabile, or stable or stabile? Stabile. Stabile. The stabile like, uh, thing for investigative journalism, but I was wondering if someone could speak more about how that program differs from just the core MS program. So. Well, I'll answer your first question. Um, uh, we all are different, our, each professor. Some professors run a website uh, and students report like in the Bronx, for instance. Uh, I run my class differently. I have my students try to publish in local uh, outlets. Last year, I had a very successful year. Eight of my 14 students published professionally. Everything from the Queen's Chronicle to the, uh, the, the Villager to uh, uh, the Brooklyn Eagle. Uh, oh my gosh, and one actually sold to uh, uh, the Cre English language p p paper in Korea and uh, an international student sold a story to a Nepal paper that he did for my class. So, uh, but both systems are to, of professional quality. Either you'll be writing for a website in the class, in the reporting class, or you'll get somebody like me who is pushing you to get your stories into uh, a wide range of media. Uh, and then later, of course, uh, my, you've heard my philosophy. I, I really want to work to see you get published. I don't want make-believe in my class. Uh, part of being a reporter, a journalist, is getting your, your material out there, and I make that part of the process. Great, thank you. Stabile? Oh, right. oh, Stabile. You know what, Christina St. Louis is going to be on the student panel, and I'm, we can ask her all to talk more um, to your second question about that. Thank you. Sure. And then what, what I'd like is we'll take the next three questions and then we're going to move to my colleague Gina Bubian, um, who is the director of our career development office and who I think will have some interesting things for you. Please. Hi. Um, my name is Jian Kim. Thank you so much for the information session today. Um, I'm personally interested in the um, MA program in the um, business and economics concentration. And I was looking at the curriculum descriptions, and I was wondering if there is a specific um, list of textbooks that we can take a look at um, mm -hmm. while writing our applications. And I was also wondering about how students get paired up when we write thesis. Uh huh. Okay. Um, thanks for your question, Jian Kim. Um, so the first question, it's, I don't teach that concentration, so I don't know exactly what's on the reading list, um, but uh, my guess is there's not a textbook. My guess is, um, like most of us, um, Professor Winnie O'Kelly is using um, a range of materials, probably a lot of um, actual journalistic examples um, from magazines and newspapers and um, TV. There, there are courses that the business concentrators take in accounting and um, corporate structure and things like that um, over in the business schools those probably do have textbooks um, but I wouldn't know what they are but you could you could email um, the professor and probably find out um, answers to that um, about how you're paired with your uh, thesis advisor um, it's from, I, I can again speak to the students in uh, the concentration that I teach in, but I assume it's pretty similar in all of them. Um, in the fall seminar, we start to get to know you, you know, from the first day. And in fact, uh, we have an orientation um, session um, right before Labor Day, the leap weekend usually. And one of the questions we ask as people introduce themselves is, what kinds of issues are you interested in? Like, what are you thinking about for a thesis? And we're, you're not expected to come in with your idea already. But like, what areas are you interested in? And we, we kind of feel you out on that and then try to match you with somebody who has um, some, you know, expertise or shares an interest uh, in the area that you're interested in. And um, usually it's somebody on our full-time faculty or part-time faculty or sometimes a professional editor um, outside of the J school, but somebody who can work with you uh, very directly on the thing that interests you most. Thank you. You're welcome. You I would also, also oh, go ahead. Go ahead you can there. find a, uh, the video of the previous info session from last month on which w Winnie was uh, on the panel and spoke at length and in detail about how she uh, teaches that course. Thank you. 
I would also mention that for the business students, there's a little bit less freedom about the outside courses that they choose at the other schools because two of the courses are sort of pre-selected for them. One is the basic accounting course, which strikes terror in my heart, mm -hmm. even though I've realized as I've gotten older that I should have taken basic accounting, um, and I'm not a reporter. <laughs> um, and the other course is um, a finance course both of which are offered um, at SEPA at the School of International and Public Affairs. Hi, I'm Hannah. Um, I'm interested in the doctoral program. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to how that program factors into all of this. <laughs> I'm going to take that question, Hannah. And actually, I'm, we're, I would say, barely covering the doctoral program. Um, in this session, and it's quite different. For all of you here, we have a doctoral program in communications. It's a, an interdisciplinary program, um, and as with the MA, makes use of the resources of the entire university. Students take a set of core courses here at the journalism school in communications, and then select their other coursework, and they do two to three years of coursework depending on the kind of transfer credit they might receive. But they can take coursework at teacher's college, at the business school, um, the law school, at SIPA, at the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, at the medical center. A lot of it will depend on the interests they have and the directions that their research might go in. Um, but you and I might also, after at the end, if you've got time, I'll be happy to sit down and talk further with you. Um, and I'll say this for everybody here, too. It is possible to visit classes here. Um, you can get in touch with David about that, um, or just send us an email in the admissions office. If you'll, you and I can talk about that, because it's also, we've got maybe one more week of classes, um, and I can see if I can get you into the doctoral prose seminar this coming week. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Zoya. Um, my question is directed towards the MS program, but I guess it's for both the MS and MA. Um, are there any limitations that international students face while pitching stories or trying to get published, particularly in the United States, not overseas? And those yes. are yes. Those, those are ice regulations, uh, not not our regulations. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but yes, indeed, there are. Mm -hmm. um, and I was going to say that for international students, it's basically against the visas that international students come here on to work in the United States. Um, so you want to be very very careful about accepting payment for work here, or actually even payment for work that you do in other countries while you are a student. Um, this did not used to be quite such an issue. It's an issue that we are cautioning international students about now. Um, there are other things that we can do to help you with the type of reporting you do, the your writing, your video and audio skills, that sort of thing. Um, but it's probably something that you'll want to speak to an immigration lawyer about if you're going to consider doing it. And one, one thing I could add about that is that um, you know the year goes by really fast. It's super intense. Um, and that probably work that you would want to publish is uh, work that you'd be doing in the spring semester mostly, um, which begins at the end of January. So, you know, if you wait till May, you, know, you can pitch it um, legally. I've had yeah, many, many just, students yeah. do that, yeah. and okay. it isn't like your work just goes into a freezer and goes nowhere. You, yeah. Yeah. At some point, when your visa expires and, and then the rules don't apply, you can do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay, I am going to invite my colleague Gina Bubion to come up. Elena, Dale, Elisa, thank you so, so much 
um, have come up on a Saturday, and I really appreciate having them here with us. Dale, take your garbage. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> we always have food at the journalism school. And I will also tell you, as the head of admissions and financial aid, one of the admission criteria is did they eat enough at the info session? You guys are all failing right now. <laughs> but please feel free to help yourselves. Good morning. So just real quickly, I'm glad that somebody asked about pitching stories um, for the international students. It's, it's really verboten. You can't make money while you're here. And so we tell students that it's really risky to try to freelance. And so it's just best if you, if you just don't. Um, however, there, a lot of students will publish in Medium, which is free. And, and, you, and there are some classes, as, as was mentioned, that have class websites. And that, of course, is, is fine. Um, but, but what the professor said about pitching stuff after you graduate, that's when the international students are safely allowed, allowed to freelance. Um, and, and you'll be happy to know that whether you publish or not during the year doesn't really impact your, your um, job you know, uh, trajectory. So I'm here to talk to you about uh, the what happens to our students after graduation, and I, I'm also going to share with you some 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 statistics that'll shed light on how the industry is doing is doing at large. So uh, first, a reality check: there is no guarantee of a job after graduation. This is journalism; it isn't law school, it isn't business school. It's a, um, a topsy turvy world, and we don't know what the journal journalism job market is going to be doing in May. 2020 or May 2021. We don't know which companies will bite the dust. We don't know which companies will launch. And, and we don't know which companies will reinvent themselves and spin, spin off successful um, launches. So the industry is definitely very dynamic. And it's actually a pretty exciting time to be a, a, a journalist. Regardless of what's going on in the general economy and the journalism market specifically, Columbia students do really, really well in the job market. And um, I'm going to share with you some statistics on how the class of 2019 did in the job market. And um, so you'll have a bigger picture of how Columbia students do and how, and it also what the, the industry is doing. Okay, so as of graduation, um, which was, so we, we took our measure of, um, of students as of June 7th, 2019. 77 percent of the class had, had plans lined up, and that was um, 20, 220 students out of a 285. And this is a, a figure that was on the high side for, for us, which was great. Um, but I, I want to just sort of break it down a bit for you, um, because it's important for you as you look at other grad schools or, or you know, whatever you want to do, is to interrogate their employment figures. Our, fi our figure, we feel really confident about our employment figures because we are taking a measure at graduation. And as a result, we have 100% of the class in the data set. And this is an important fact for you to know. So as you look at other grad schools, you ought to be asking, what percentage of the class is in the data set, and when the measure is taken. A lot of schools, including our colleagues at the law school, uh, take their measure 11 months after graduation. The business school takes their measure three months after graduation. Maybe other journalism schools have their own, their own rules. So we feel like we want to know what happens to students at graduation. And so what happens during the summer is this, this figure ticks up throughout the entire summer. So based, just based on anecdotal, occasional LinkedIn checking and emails that we're getting from students, uh, the figure has sort of crept up into the high 80s by now. But it's not, that's anecdotal. It's not official because we have not sort of methodically um, pursued every student who was, who was still looking for, for that first job after graduation. OK. This is how the statistics break down. Um, when we talk about plans, we're talking about a wide range of categories. We're talking about internships, fellowships, jobs, 
um, people going on to further academic study, which happens every single year. Students who are serious about freelancing and have, have freelance assignments set up at, at graduation. It's a whole range of, of categories. What's missing is unpaid internships. That's really not a thing anymore, fortunately. Um, and you know, maybe, maybe one student per year will voluntarily do a, an unpaid internship, and there's always a specific reason for it, because maybe it was their dream, you know, their dream to work at a particular place. But I actually can't think of anybody from last year's class who did an unpaid internship. It's not really um, very common. So the big piece of the pie that you ought to notice is the blue, the blue slice. That's the internship and fellowship slice of the pie. It's big, and I want you to understand that that is the most likely uh, outcome of J School. This is not a specific thing to Columbia, and it's not a specific thing to 2019. It's been the case for the entire time we've been keeping track of these statistics, and it was true when I was in journalism school um, decades ago. Um, we like internships. Internships are your chance to prove yourself and get hired full time or lead to another job, and they're always paid. So, and you're always doing real work. There, it is, our students don't do menial tasks, you know, sorting clothes and hanging them up in a closet. That does not happen at this school. Um, you're doing journalism uh, work. You're reporting stories. You're on deadline like everybody else. And the fact that, that internships happen usually in the summertime means that you're filling in for the regular staff that's on summer vacation. So you really are expected to hit the ground running and perform at a high level. And um, so the, the fact that most of our students, students do internships at, after graduation, this holds for every group here. It holds for the MS students, the MA students, the international students, and the US students, okay? So it's not something that we shy away from talking about. We actually love internships because it's your chance to leap to a big publication after, after graduation, okay. Um, any international students in the room? I know there's a few. Okay, so um, for those of you who will be applying to for a, a work visa after graduation, every student who goes through this program gets a one year long OPT, it's called, and it's part of the visa, and you just have to apply for it and, and you get it. So I want you to understand that our international students have done as well as or sometimes better than the US students, and that's what this graphic is showing you. Um, the blue line is the US student trajectory and the red line are the international students. So last year, 80% of the international students had something at graduation compared to 75.5% for the US students. And as you can see, it's been neck and neck. I could have gone back in time and seen the same kind of trajectory, and you'll see that gap in 2017. So I want to just discuss that. That was hopefully an aberration. That was the spring that Trump took office. And um, what happened was that was, a, that was the first time we saw this big disparity. And specifically, 66% of the international students had something at graduation compared to 78% for the US students. And it alarmed us, and it, and it saddened us. And uh, what was going on, there were several things going on. Um, double the number of international students that spring decided to go home and look for work. So they, it, you know, it was usually about 4 to 5% of the international students who elect to go home, maybe they have families or what have you that they need to return to, that year it was double, it was 10%, so that made a difference. Um, in addition, there were companies that were afraid to hire international students, enough, enough companies that you know, contributed to this, to this um, divergence here. And so what happened was, you know, they were afraid they'd have visa issues hiring an international student. Um, so what happened was, the following year, 2018 spring, things kind of reverted to the usual. And, um, and then last year, it was sort of the, the, the usual as well. So uh, we don't know what's going to happen next year, but just a, a heads up that it's a little bit unpredictable. It's also very sort of looking pa past OPT. A lot of our students come here hoping to stay for many years in the US. And other than the, the STEM visa students who can stay for, I think it's three, two and a half to three, to three years after graduation, most students do have to go home. Um, there are very few companies that sponsor outright. And, um, and so that's, that's sort of the, the reality. The more likely way that you would get sponsored if you're just determined to get sponsored is um, just to consider business journalism, economics journalism. This is where a lot of the hiring is and this is where you'll find the companies that are visa agnostic who would, who would sponsor you and who, and who need um, the lang language skills that you might have. Okay, 
Um, so let's talk about what, what employers are looking, are looking for. And this should, answer, should sort of, this contributes to the, the question about, you know, what is this school doing to help students, you know, whether the fake news allegations, et cetera. Employers look for, for um, reporters. That's what they come to the J School for. And um, you know, it's journalism, so they're looking for reporters. We ask employers every year at the expo, at our career expo, what's the main thing that you're looking for? And they overwhelmingly say, we're looking for reporters. We're looking for people who know how to go out and interview and gather data and tell stories. Um, a distant second, they're looking for video and um, video production skills. And then third, they're looking for data. Data journalism is definitely a category that has been climbing in the ranks for the last few years. And um, so has audio reporting and production been climbing in the, in the ranks. Audio is, podcasting is this exciting, exploding um, platform right now that's, that's really exciting for students and there's just constant production of, of new audio um, programming, which is really, really exciting. And a lot of our students come into this school and then fall in love with radio and, that, and, and, and pursue that after graduation. Analytics, innovation, R&D, product, all these sort of technological kind of jobs that require computing skills and data skills. We added, we looked at this for the first time this year because they sort of emerged from the data and we needed to sort of account for them. So taken together, it's definitely, you can definitely see, taken together with data skills, you can see um, that there's a lot of demand for, for data skills. Okay, um, oops. So we also ask students at the end of the year, what's the main thing you've been hired to do in your job? And as you can see, the vast majority say that the main thing they've been hired to do is report and write. What's exciting about this, or interesting I should say, is that this is regardless of what platform they end up in, they're hired to report and write. And by distant second place is, they've been, they've, they tell us they've been hired to do video and audio production. And, and then third, data and computing. Taken all three together, reporting, video and audio, and data, that's 94% of the entire class. So that's pretty much you know, what, what students are doing at graduation. And then there's a few other categories. Now I want to just point out on-air reporting, it looks like a tiny little sliver there at the, at, in the middle of that graph. Who here is interested in becoming an on-air reporter? Reporting live from the scene in a, in a city. Okay, well. We definitely have students who do that, and um, it's a small number because, not because we don't train students to do that, because we do. What's going on in this, in this field is that there is not the, the tradition of internships and fellowships in the on-air reporting world. It's just full-time jobs, and so what happens is students who, who want to be on-air reporters need time to put their reel together. And, and send it out to 30 different news directors all over the country. So students do get those jobs, but they're landing them like closer to graduation or, or the, in the, you know, within the first month or two of summer. And that's just how it's always been. And students, you know, we'll, you'll, we'll see the data, we'll see the, the broadcast students, you know, in the studios sort of sharpening their reels and sending it out and, um, at graduation and, af and after graduation. So that's what's going on there. Okay, this graph is really fun because what this shows you is how students students divide up amongst the platforms and the red line is the digital only publications and for the longest time that line was on the upward trajectory and it was part of our mantra it was part of the mantra in all of journalism the rise of digital and then last year it plunged which is which you know we kind of saw it coming you know buzzfeed had layoffs and mike um and and you know, courts had, had layoffs or, or freezes and, and um, publications like that. We don't know what's going to happen next year, so we're not prepared to say this is the new reality. We just need to see what happens. Um, the blue line is the video and um, the broadcast, you know, um, line, basically, and that includes broadcast jobs, t I mean, video, audio, and network um, production jobs. And that line has definitely been a very bouncy but generally up for the last many years. The green line is newspapers, which despite everything you hear, has kind of held its own. I mean, it's, it's also been a little um, erratic, but it's, it's held its own. It has not collapsed at all. And uh, we, we like newspapers, and our students like newspapers. It's where you find really good editors to train you to be really good and, and raise your game and edit you and help you be, become better after graduation. 
The orange line is the magazine line. Definitely a downward trajectory, and this shouldn't surprise anybody. At the beginning of the digital news revolution, news magazines thought, oh, that doesn't apply to us. There will always be people who want to curl up in a chair and read their magazine, and that actually wasn't true, right? Um, so they were slow to catch on, and also at the same time, the voicey, authoritative, long-form writing um, that you find in magazines appeared on the di in the digital space. And so that's where people get those, those, those kinds of stories that they want to read um, and, and spend time with. So, you know, there are some students that do get hired on the online side of magazines, but it's so very few. Um, the purple line is, is the wire service line, and we're talking Agence France Press and Reuters and the AP and um, Bloomberg, those are the biggies. And um, they will always, they always sort of account for a good chunk of hiring and they love our students who have language skills and they love our international students and they love our students who are interested, interested in business journalism. These are, the, these are the news organizations that have the hundreds of bureaus all over the world. So if, you are heart, if your heart is set on being a foreign correspondent, I would encourage you to imagine yourself as a business reporter who can also cover you know, whatever else pops up, like Reuters is always on the scene of every major story in the world, but, you, but they are also, they're there primarily to report on the economy of, of, the, of the city or, or a country. Okay, um, I made a little word cloud to show you where students landed from last year's class. And you should have a list of the, ent the entire list in your packet that you picked up downstairs. But um, this is just a fun list that shows, uh, word cloud that shows you the concentration. So the larger the font, the more students got hired at that publication. And this is uh, just more of a, of a boring, you know, um, wordy breakdown of that, of that um, picture. So as of graduation, nine people went to CNN, eight to Bloomberg, seven to NB ABC, etc. Um, these numbers are fluid. By the end of summer, I think a dozen people had gone to CNN. CNN loves Columbia. Um, there's, a, there's a concentration, like uh, companies come to this school and they hire a bunch of students, not just one. That's my point. Um, and I encourage you to do your own checking um, you know, on LinkedIn, etc. So let's talk about pay. Um, it, minimum wage went up to 15 bucks an hour last December 31st in New York City, which we were glad about because there were some major news organizations that paid less than that. So now at least it's $15 minimum. But the pay varies widely. It, it, it varies from 15 an hour to 1200 a week, which is a pretty big range. Um, internship pay is temporary, which is what we always remind our students, and sometimes it's worth it. If you can tough it out for the summer, something else is going to happen. Uh, I'm thinking of a very popular digital-only newsroom that our students like to apply to. They pay 18 bucks an hour for their internship, but their entry-level jobs are 57000 which is livable um, in New York. And there are also, you know, that kind of salary, 40 to 50000 is livable in a lot of cities in, in the country. Less so here, less so San Francisco, but livable in, in other parts of the, of the country. Um, there are other states in the country that have a much lower minimum wage than this one, and that's, that's actually tough, but so we're, you're, seeing, you're seeing the range here. Okay. The Expo. Every spring we put on a huge career expo, which I hope that you've seen the video. You can see the video if you want. It's on the website. And um, last spring to interview our 300 students, 300 recruiters showed up from 160-ish companies. So it was a really productive day, let's just say. And it's, it's interviewing just like you're interviewing for a job and dozens of job offers and internship offers come out of the expo. It's a big, it's a huge event partly because employers are concentrated in New York, but also employers know they're going to find really good students here who are really well trained. So that's why it's been such a big success. So wherever you are interested in, go on LinkedIn and do some counting. Like if you need to live in Paris, France after graduation, go to the, the LinkedIn pages of the schools you want to apply to and see how many alums they have in, in Paris, France, or in Kansas, or in California, or what have you. So I did a little checking. You can do this yourself too. Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism LinkedIn page is open, and you can click on the alumni button and just type in the name of the publication and just see what you're getting yourself into because the, the alumni network at this school is really powerful. 
and helpful to each other, okay? The last thing on that list, Report for America. Have all of you heard of Report for America by now? Okay, this was founded by our grad, Charlie Sennett, and Steve Waldman, who founded BeliefNet, and they have created this huge um, reporting project that is putting reporters in news deserts around the country. And so we had, uh, they had about 60 slots last year, and seven of them were our students, and they went all over the country working in, in audio and, and, and um, print newsrooms. And so we are, we're excited to get involved in that again. Okay, now I would like to show you some work that our recent grads have done. This is, the cl this is um, what I did was Kylie Roche was a grad of this last year's class, and she came to visit me this week to say, oh, I just got this story published in Bloomberg Business Week. So that's why I, I looked on the rest of Bloomberg to see what else she had been up to, and I found the story that she just did. Um, she had a, an internship at the Wall Street Journal one summer before grad school that was not really a full internship. There were things that led to her not being able to do the entire internship. She was only there for like se seven weeks. Um, so she didn't have that much experience is what is my point. And she came to the J School and, um, and then got hired by, by Bloomberg. Um, this student was from University of Florida, Champ Barton, or actually um, possibly not U of F, but he's from Florida. He was a neuroscience and computer science undergrad, and um, he got hired by The Trace, which is a publication that covers gun issues, and they really needed him for his data, his computer science skills, and he's also a pretty good writer. And so he's having, he's in a six month long fellowship at The Trace, and this is just one example of something that he recently, recently put up. Um, then we have a couple students out at the Deseret News. The Deseret News is in Salt Lake City, and you, believe it or not, is it, it is this jewel of long-form narrative training because the editor there is one of our grads who um, is a, an award-winning alt-weekly and magazine writer who is back in his home state running this paper, um, and he, he came to the expo and hired Ethan Bauer and another student, and Ethan wanted to be a sports reporter, and so he's been writing long-form narrative sports stories to his heart's content since he got to the Deseret News, and he's just having a great run. Um, I encourage you to look up his byline and read some of those stories. It's really hard to get hired in sports journalism, just FYI. Um, and, um, and so Ethan was pretty happy to get this job. Okay, now I thought I'd run through real quickly some tra trajectories of students so you can perhaps find your, yourself in these, in these um, profiles. So Julia had no journalism experience in college. She resisted becoming a journalist until, um, until she was a senior. And then she got an internship at the Berkshire Eagle, which is up in Pittsfield, Mass. She came to Columbia, and then she went to the LA Times, and then she came back to Washington, D.C. to take a video internship at CNN. Her choice, the LA Times would have kept her, but she wanted to do video, so she came back for a second internship, and that's where she is. Samantha was at University of Missouri, and she um, was a, a business reporter immediately after graduation, and then she came to Columbia, and then she had a, a few choices to make, and she chose a full-time job as a bankruptcy reporter for the American lawyer. Brianna was a University of, um, of, of Florida, a Florida Atlantic grad who was at Politico the summer before Columbia, and she came here, and then she got a full-time fact-checker job with benefits at The New Yorker. Um, we also have career changers here. Anybody here coming from a non-journalism background? Okay, so every year we have a few teachers, former teachers, former AmeriCorps and Teach for America students, and they come here feeling really demoralized about the state of education, and they want to be education reporters. And so that was our Erica situation. And so she um, trained here, and she got um, the Internship at Heckinger Report, which is a very high quality digital nonprofit newsroom at base at Teachers College. And then she got hired at the Austin American Statesman. The editor, the executive editor of the Austin American Statesman came to the expo and met her there and hired her as soon as her internship was up. And Pranchu had nev never been in journalism. He was only in federal and city and state government. And he came here as a Stabile student, did investigative training here, and got hired at the Philadelphia Inquirer and then was hired full time. He has a lot of sources in Philly, and so that was a phenomenal promotion for him to go from 
intern to City Hall reporter. Um, Paul was in the, was in, at Human Rights Watch, which is a, a good publication, but it's not, it's like an advocacy organization, and he wanted to switch away from that and get s into pure journalism. So he came here and he was hired at The Intercept after graduation. And there's just a couple more examples. Um, Sarah was, um, she, went, she was a fixer in Istanbul for a couple years before Columbia, and she didn't really have any clips. I mean, opinion writing isn't one of those categories that um, counts so much with, ed with editors, um, so she really had like no clips, and so she was just wanted to be a foreign correspondent, and she thought she got it, fell into freelance fixing, which was um, a little bit you know, exciting, and she was using her translation skills and communication skills, but not so much reporting and journalism, so she came to Columbia, and then she was hired at Reuters, first as a fellow or a trainee and then as a full-time um, reporter. Alex um, also had been, you know, doing sort of congressional, U.S. congressional internships each summer of um, college. Meanwhile, all the while, you know, be, being involved in the student newspaper up at Bates. And then he just decided, okay, yes, journalism for sure. And he did a journalism internship right before Columbia, and then he got hired at the Miami Herald the first week of his internship at the Miami Herald, his master's project, which hasn't been mentioned yet, but everybody has to do a major master's project in, during the year. And um, it was published on the front page of the New York Times the first week of his internship at um, at the Miami Herald, and then he was hired at the McClatchy Bureau to fill in for somebody who went on maternity leave, and then he got hired full time, um, which was very exciting. And then Heather was into photography. We don't have that many photographers here, but just a few. And um, and she had a, a, a good, you know, fellowship at a big um, at a big. Um, publication in Michigan, and then she got hired into the Lendfest Fellowship, and she's still in it. It's a two-year-long fellowship, and she's the sole phot photography um, intern, which is, which is a great job. And that's all I have. If anybody has questions, I'm, if there's time, is there time for questions? Okay. Oh, the, to the student who asked about MA business classes, a lot of students take classes at SEPA in the MA business program. And the classes that they, you can look on the course selection um, catalog at SEPA to, to, and look up classes that are called like accounting, international finance, um, those are sort of corporate accountability, classes like that I see students from the MA business class take a lot. Yes. Hi, my name's John. Hi. Um, something that really excites me about this program is uh, are the postgraduate uh, fellowships, yes. particularly the ones abroad. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about those. Okay, so there are several dozen fellowships and short-term short internships that exist at the J School that only our students compete for. Um, some of them are like at Frontline. There's a list on the, on the website. It changes a little bit every year, but you're basically only competing with each other for those slots. And, um, and then there are also internships at, um, at fellowships that are based at the J School, like the, there's an in, uh, investigative reporting fellowship that's about a year long. Well, you, you know, there was, some, there was something in the, in the news just this week about, about one of those stories. I'm, oh, the, the story about, um, was it the Uber story or was it the dating app story? Did you all see the dating? That Matt will talk about it <laughs> when he's on, on the panel. panel. Um, there's a gender and migration fellowship and there's um, cross borders investigations fellowship and these are based here with professors guiding, guiding the reporting and place and getting these stories published. But Matt will talk about more, that more. Um, the international spots, it depends on which, on which one you're interested in because like for instance the ones in London they prefer if you have a work authorization in, in England for, for that one um, but like the one in uh, in Italy or or Chile or uh, Argentina you know you just need like fluent Italian and fluent um, Spanish thank you hi my name is Claire thank hi. you um, I have two questions, actually. The first one, uh, how long do you find that your students typically spend in internships before they get a full-time job? An internship is typically a 10-week summer internship or 12 weeks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can be four, can be six, um, the fellowships. We just, we kind of don't really differentiate between a fellowship that's like four to six months long and an internship. Okay. Thank you. Um, my second question was, uh, I know that there are a variety of areas of specialization in the MS program, and I was wondering if you found that any particular area of specialization had greater success in getting students into the job market faster, um, or if there's not really a difference? 
Um, I can't say that there's a difference. I, th I think, um, I mean, the, the, the Stabile students do, do very well. The, the, you know, the data students do very well. Um, there's, there's, I don't know, I, I, can't, I can't really say. I don't think there's that much of a, of a difference between. I think the, the main difference is if you come into the school with like zero experience, it, you, you know, you, you're gonna be a little anxious as you watch other students land like the big internships throughout the year. But you know, somebody, the, there are plenty of opportunities that happen late in the year. And like I said, the students with, with like very little experience sometimes do get, get the really great internships, but if, if they don't, they're, they're, they're finding something like during, during the summer. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Good luck with your decision. Thank you so much, Gina. Um, we are just going to set up quickly here for our student panel, um, and then I will introduce you to them. They will introduce themselves to you. Um, we've got a terrific student panel, as well as two alums um, who are here to talk about the data journalism program, and who can also talk with you about the postgraduate fellowships that we have. Uh, because they happen to be in them. So that'll be great. So I'm going to invite my student panelists to come on up. Appa. They're going to show you by example that we all love our food, eat and drink here because we're all eating and drinking at very odd hours because of the kind of work that we do. They, because they are journalists and becoming journalists and at least in my office because we're admissions and financial aid people and admissions and financial aid people always eat. So I'm going to ask my um, student panelists to introduce themselves. They'll mention which program they're in um, and a little bit about how they got into journalism, how they landed here. Please feel free to come up to the microphone, ask questions. We really do want this to be a conversation that you can have with the students. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Matt Albasi. Uh, I'm from Philadelphia. Before I came to Columbia, I was uh, I did my undergrad in journalism and graduated into an awful job market and wasn't able to find anything. And so I started my own production company just for fun while bartending with a few of my friends, and it turned into a business. And eventually, we bought a newspaper and. It was just a local weekly, and we started running that for about four or five years before we finally called it quits, and then I was sort of trying to decide what, what to do next. And I'd seen all these stories come through on these, this local newspaper that if we just knew, had somebody who knew how a computer worked better than anyone else, like we, someone who knew Python or uh, you know, how to scrape a website or make a basic map, we would have been able to do some really amazing stories. And so when I heard about the data program here, um, I figured, what the hell, it's worth a shot. So I signed up for, or I applied for it, um, and I got in, and it was great. Um, now I'm doing the postgraduate fellowship with Giannina Segnini, who runs the data program. I'm one of the cross-border data investigative fellows. I think I got the order right. Um, and we're looking into the, sort of the intersection of church and finance. Uh, and basically, I spend all day being an investigative journalist in the basement here. Uh, and I get to continue working with some of my colleagues that I met last year and some of my professors that I got to know while I was here. Hi. Thank you, Matt. 
Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Sarah Collins. Uh, I'm from Los Angeles originally. I went to the University of Southern California, Annenberg, so I was in their journalism school in undergrad and also double majored in political science. Um, and then was sort of waffling between the two uh, as far as what I wanted to do for all of college. Um, and then after the election of 2016 happened, I decided actually to go into politics. Um, so I moved to Philadelphia and worked on a congressional campaign there for t uh, like a year and a half um, and kind of quickly realized that I had picked the wrong one of the two majors. Um, and so I spent a long time thinking about you know, should I just try to get a journalism job after this? Or, you know, is there any way I could sort of hone my skills more? Um, and I come from a family of filmmakers, being from LA, and I've always loved documentary films. Um, so I applied for Columbia's documentary film program, and so I'm one of the, there's 15 of us. Um, and now I'm working on my thesis, which is um, for the doc students, a 30 minute film that, you know, is considered at the same level as other filmmakers. We show them at you know film festivals. Uh, a couple or a pair um, last year just won a Student Academy Award. Um, and my personal project uh, is about uh, something called Social Circus, which teaches kids circus skills to boost their confidence. So I've been going to Trenton and back a lot because that's where my nonprofit is located. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Brent? Hi, good morning. Uh, so my name is Brandon Drennan. And I graduated from the University of Texas way back in 2011. Uh, my undergraduate degree was in video production, and I worked on a few small independent films and commercials around Austin and in LA before coming to New York in 2013. For the past six and a half years leading into Columbia Journalism School, I was a personal trainer at Equinox. Um, for those of you who live here and for those that are planning to come here, New York is a very expensive city, as most of us know. And so my main focus during those first six years was to just get established in the city, and I did that. Um, and found myself financially comfortable within my career as a personal trainer, but I wanted to be challenged. Uh, I wanted to be pulled outside of my comfort zone. I wanted to get back to storytelling, which is what I was in pursuit of as an undergraduate in uh, video production. And um, during that time, personal training, I also had a column with the Huffington Post writing on health and fitness. And that evolved into a freelance writing contract with the New York Post on similar content. Um, but none of that really had me prepared for all the challenges that I've been facing here as a, under, or as a, as a graduate student at Columbia, which I'm really appreciative for. And um, I guess a project that I'm working on right now that I'm enjoying is a short documentary. I'm in the visual craft program. It's not listed on the website, but if you're admitted, you'll have an option to apply. And basically, you get training in photo and video. So I'm working on a short doc that's um, looking at a neuroscientist who's growing many brains in a lab to discover the origins of schizophrenia. So like, you know, eight months ago as a personal trainer, if you would have asked me would I know anything about many brains or schizophrenia, absolutely not. But these are the kind of opportunities that you have in New York City at Columbia. And uh, I'm really grateful to be here. Hi everyone, my name is Brett Forrest. Um, I'm from Colorado, I went to University of Colorado. I also graduated in 2011, so it's been a while. Um, just turned 30, so if you're feeling like you might be too old, don't worry, there are a wide range of ages here, so uh, it's pretty great. Um, I studied film and anthropology in undergrad, and I actually worked for a documentary company for a bit in Colorado before um, working video production at a news station in Denver. And I never considered journalism before that, but I, I ended up working in broadcast TV for about the next six years. And eventually it just kind of rubbed off on me. And I realized I wanted to do the journalism side of things rather than the video production side. So um, that's what led me to apply here. Um, and I'm also in the documentary track with Sarah. Uh, since I had the video background, I thought, why not? When, I, when am I ever gonna make a documentary otherwise? And uh, the good thing about the program here is you have people like me who have extensive video background, but you also have people who have never touched a camera before, and they were also able to uh, learn all that training in the doc program. And um, at this point, we're all pitching our reels and proposals to uh, be accepted to start producing next week. If you go down the hall after this, uh, it's the doc fest of all the students from last year who 
Um, it's their thesis film, pretty much, as Sarah mentioned. So they are screening across the hall all day today. So if you want to take a peek at uh, some of the work people have made, you can do that. Um, and yeah, I, uh, I'm also in a profile writing class right now. I'm trying to um, get in a um, production class next semester about um, either broadcast TV or city newsroom, um, is the class they call it. So, I, I mean, it, it, it's a great experience here, and I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. Christina? Yeah. Hi, I'm Christina. I'm an MS student in the Stabile program, and I came to the program directly after undergrad. I studied American Studies, which is sort of an interdisciplinary history major, um, and I was at Barnard College. So I was used to being in the city, but I knew that I wanted to find a way to get into journalism in a way that I hadn't been exposed to before, even though I did a couple of internships in undergrad, and I also did campus talk radio. Um, one thing that I was lacking was a close editing relationship with the people that I was working with. Um, so I wanted to come to a place where I would have really close editing from professors and in a context of doing local journalism because um, that's something I'm interested in doing post-Columbia is local investigative reporting. Um, but like you'll hear from many different career advisors, you don't, it's not guaranteed that you'll go directly into investigative work. So the good thing about this program is that while you, if you choose to do the Stabile program, while you are doing investigative um, projects looking into public records and also looking into things like PACER, Nexus, Lexis. Um, you also have the opportunity to do regular um, like sort of beat reporting as well in other classes. For instance, in my reporting class, I did uh, reporting on the Bronx and we all got to choose our own beat and published it on a website called the Bronx Inc. Um, and so you do get a variety of experience no matter which program you choose to be in because all of the classes focus on something um, special. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions related to the Stabile program and general life here. Yeah, I'm just gonna invite you, you know, when you have questions to go up to the microphone and as I said, we want this to be a conversation. I know that I've got somebody here who's interested in asking questions about Stabile. Um, Matt, because we didn't have, uh, on the faculty panel, we didn't have one of the data professors this morning. I'm gonna ask you to talk just a little bit more about um, the program and the opportunities, and maybe to talk a little bit about data journalism and what that is. Sure. <clears throat> so um, the data program here is one of the best things about it is it starts from zero. I didn't know how to code when I came in. I knew how the computer worked generally, um, but I, I didn't have any of these like coding environments on my computer. But so like day one is how to turn on your computer, how to set it up. And then I, I was a little worried that it was actually going to be too slow, but by week two or three, you're already into scraping information off of websites, starting to make basic visualizations with it you get very advanced very quickly. And by week eight or so, you're already doing sort of journalistic projects based on it. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the, so the beginning of the data program starts off with the lead program. So you're sort of mixed in with a bunch of other students, many of whom have uh, more experience uh, in, in journalism. The lead program is more of a, uh, a like mid-career training generally. And then once you're finished with that, you transition into the reporting classes and some data-specific classes. Um, and so I, sorry, I guess I should get to what data journalism is. Huh. Um, you see a few different sides of it here. Um, you've definitely got the sort of, I, I like to divide it up into the product, the visual journalism, and the computer-assisted reporting. Um, those are really the three sort of main buckets that you can fall into. Um, and if you're on the product side, you're doing things like building the CMS. You're working in languages like PHP, HTML, and CSS. And you're usually building news apps and things like that. The visual journalism side is a little bit more of how do you take data and condense it into a form that people can ingest easily and quickly. And that's usually in the form of scrolly telling, uh, you know, like the snowfall it was a New York piece that every, New York Times piece that everybody knows. Um, making graphs and making all sorts of visualizations with the data. And then you have the computer-assisted reporting, which is really where the 
data program shines. Uh, and that's sort of how can you leverage this tool to be a better reporter. Um, and Jeanina Segnini, who runs the program, is just an absolute expert at that. And so like the project we're working on now is we're taking uh, just hundreds of court files, which ends up, being, ends up being thousands of pages of PDFs, um, and feeding them through a system that turns them from a PDF into a computer-readable format. And then from that, it extracts all of the names and businesses and draws connections between them so that we can take all of these what seem like disparate court cases and find the commonalities between them. Um, and this is just one of the ways that computers can be used to, I mean, otherwise we'd have to sit there and read and map out uh, all these hundreds of connections by hand, and it, that's just not going to happen. You know, I, I, there's a scene in, uh, I think, this Spotlight movie where they're all uh, in the basement going through old yearbooks trying to find like which priests were shuffled around to which office. And it's you know a montage sequence that's supposed to cover like months. Um, and I, I think that that's the best example of like why you might want to come be a data journalist because you, you don't have to do that. <laughs> you don't write a computer <laughs> program to do that for you, hopefully. You might spend months writing the computer program to do it, but it, it feels a little bit better. Um, now in terms of like opportunities, uh, I mean it's uh, certainly a, people want data journalists. There's not a lot of us. I mean, I think we graduated 10. There's another 20 coming out this year. As far as I know, Columbia is the only place that actually is giving uh, degrees. Is that for, for data journalism? One of? There's uh, not many. There are f a couple in the country. So the, the competition isn't very stiff, which is great. I mean, my class ended up at Washington Post. Angela was front page of the New York Times. Uh, you know, it, everyone landed on their feet in good positions with good pay, which is, I think, more than, more than you can ask for. Great. Thank you very much. I would also mention that if there are people who are interested in getting a taste of data journalism, a taste of investigative journalism, but that is an, a taste of video, audio, but it's not what you want to focus on, the general MS program provides the opportunity for you to do that because the curriculum is designed so that you generally must take a video or an audio course, you've got to take the reporting course, you must take an investigative techniques course. So you get some training in those things, but you don't get the intensive training that you would get either in the documentary program, the Stabile program, um, or in the kind of um, direct work that you would be doing in the visual craft program. So, and the visual craft is, well, I'm gonna let Brandon explain that because he's, he's better at it than I am. Um, and maybe those of you in documentary and, and visual craft could talk a little bit about the differences there because, you know, the doc documentary is a longer sort of thing, visual craft, is also focusing on people who want to be behind the camera as opposed to in front of it. Um, and we do have opportunities for study for people who are interested as well in being anchors, but we're training you as journalists first. Um, but anyway, I'm gonna invite you all to talk just a little bit about those programs and the differences in them. So briefly, just with the documentary program, it's actually a third semester program, uh, meaning we come to school in August and we graduate in August the next year. Everyone else is done in May. So you do have that extra summer semester to finish filming and editing your documentary because a 30 minute film is no joke. It's a lot of work. So um, you wrap up your classes in May, then the rest of your time here at Columbia is finishing up your film and as I mentioned, it is your thesis, so it, it's a big deal. Um, and yeah, it, it's it's a lot of extra work so far. Um, I've noticed opposed to the general MS program, but if you're, I mean, if you're coming to Columbia, it's just one year, so um, you just got to buckle down, kind of put in the work, and uh, in the end, it'll be worth it. So just uh, keep that in mind. Uh, I also forgot to mention, if anyone has questions, that I'm going to be in the book writing class next semester, which is like a coveted class um, that you have to apply to get into and I'm one of three people crazy enough to have done to will 
to do a documentary and book writing at the same time. Um, She's really nuts. <laughs> we'll see what I'm what I'm in for. <laughs> um, but yeah, also um, one other thing to add is uh, we work with you know career people in their careers at like editors and things like that who you know help us make our films. Great. Um, so listening, I didn't know much, too much about the documentary program, but one of the biggest differences in the visual craft program is going to be the photo training. Um, the beautiful thing about the visual craft program in my mind is you can spend the entire year working on honing your video storytelling skills by taking a video class in the first and second semester. Um, unlike the general MS program, in the very beginning of the semester, not only were we learning reporting, uh, but we were also learning the fundamentals of how to tell a story visually with a camera, a photo camera, uh, and a video camera. So you're getting thrown into the fire immediately and learning so many things at once. Um, I'd also kind of jokingly talking with other general MS students, I think it's it, it may be a bit more challenging because, again, in addition to the reporting class that everyone's going to have to take, you're also going to be responsible for producing uh, photographic story elements and video uh, story segments. So, like he mentioned, I think you know you're coming to Columbia, you're looking to be challenged, and you know with that mindset, you can really develop as a storyteller across different platforms by applying to the visual craft program and and learning how to do it behind a video camera, a photo camera, or with you know good old fashioned computer and typing. Great, thank you. I'm going to start with the questions because I know that uh, there are a couple of my panelists who are doing double duty at the Doc Festival as well. So if you've got questions, now's the time. Thank you. My question's for Christina. Um, I'm John, I'm applying to the MS program, and I'm curious to hear um, about the ability of students in the Stabile program to specialize in an area. I know you mentioned that you're interested in local investigative work. Are there students who do specialization in business and economic investigative reporting, and can you kind of touch on that, if, if so? Yeah, so just like with the other programs here, we also have to produce a six-month-long um, well, that's the estimated time it takes um, investigation as our master's thesis or a master's project. And each of us gets to decide what we want to focus on. So for me, even though I'm interested in local reporting, I thought I'd zero in a little bit further. And so I'm trying to do an investigative story on um, environmental politics and um, the fertilizer industry. Uh, so that's what I'm focusing on, but I know there are people who are looking at things that fall into business or nonprofit work. Some people are looking at hospitals. So I think it's your chance to really zone in on one area and find out how to investigate that deeper and learn the language of that space if that's what you're interested in doing after um, college. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to just jump in for one second. Taryn has let me know that our colleague Jim, who runs all of the, he's the head of AV here at the journalism school, has offered to, for any of you who can stay after we're finished, he has offered to show you the uh, broadcast and television studio upstairs, uh, which is always a real treat, and the control room up there, so that you can get an idea of what we're doing up there as well. Go ahead. Hey, I'm Emily. I have a question for the documentary and visual storytellers. Um, how much room is there for collaboration? And also, as well, a lot of the MS panelists from the first professorship were talking about how a lot of the journalism is focused mostly in New York. Um, but for the documentaries, is there opportunity to take that outside of New York? And if so, are you just lone wolfing with a camera? Um, so actually, for the doc program, there is a lot of room for collaboration. Um, we work with partners, so all we're doing is collaborating um, just because realistically to deal with the camera and sound and editing and everything, you couldn't do it alone, um, although people have <laughs> and they've succeeded. But um, And it's like discouraged um, from reporting sort of outside the New York area. I'm even pushing it a little bit being in Trenton, which is like a two-hour train ride. Um, 
but people have, you know, spent their winter breaks going to different countries even. Um, there's one film actually that I'll be showing today. Uh, they went to Zimbabwe for a couple of weeks in the summer, but th that being said, the main reporting component was in New York City. Yeah, my film is going to be um, based in Poughkeepsie, New York, so hour and a half, two hour train ride up north. And I mean, it's a little further than you want to be, but that's where I found a great story. And so that's what I'm pursuing. Um, then outside of school, I know people from the program kind of freelance and do their own thing all over the country and all over the world. So um, as a documentarian, you're never tied down just to New York opposed to other forms of journalism. But um, I mean, it's still a great place to be if you're trying to collaborate with other documentary filmmakers. I'll also mention um, for the master's uh, projects in general and for the master's theses as well for the MA students, generally we encourage students to try and stay within the five boroughs because uh, a monthly metro card is a lot cheaper than air tickets to a lot of different places. And one of the things that you find when you're in journalism school is that you're making mistakes that have to be corrected. You forgot to ask a question. You forgot to turn the camera on. The lens was the lens cap was still on. Things like that where you have to go back and re-interview people. Um, so just so that you know, the opportunities are there to go to lots of different places, you want to consider your budget, and that's one of the things that you learn how to do here. Hi, my name is Ari. Um, my question is for those of you who mentioned um, studying journalism in your undergraduate degree or sort of a journalism adjacent program. Um, what is the sort of value add for you for coming to graduate school um, as opposed to just going out with your undergraduate degree? Yeah. Uh, so I did my undergrad in journalism at uh, Temple, um, and I, for me it was pretty clear the my curriculum did not teach anything about computers. So it, it was a you know the value add was was clear. Mm -hmm. um, but even beyond that, I mean, you've got for one the the contacts, the people that I met here, and the people that I, I worked with and continue to work with are just in a different league than they were in in Philadelphia, um, and even though it's you're learning some of the same things, you know, you already know what a nut graph is, you know, you're going to be ahead of some other students, but some of the other students are going to excel beyond you. And because it's such a close and collaborative uh, program, you're going to learn from them. So it, sometimes it's not necessarily what you're learning from the class that might be rehashing something you already learned in undergrad, but what you learn from the professor as an individual or from your classmates is, is certainly worth it. Um, and I would say for me, uh, I feel like I studied broadcast journalism in undergrad, so I learned how to make like, and here's reporter Sarah with the story and those kind of things. Um, and I knew I wanted to do documentary and, and that wasn't as uh, comparable, I'd say. Like we were using basically like soccer mom video cameras to make those videos. So I really wanted to hone in on like the editing skills. Um, and as far as writing, like because I was a broadcast major, I you know took maybe one or two actual like physical writing classes, and I know that writing obviously is a critical part of any journalism medium, whether it's radio, you know, documentary, obviously print. Um, and even in my, like the first couple weeks, I could already tell that Columbia is just such a cut above uh, anything that I had experienced. And the, the commitment that the professors have, you know, they literally line by line edit everything you do um, and really care about making your work good. Um, in a way that I had not experienced before. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, hi, Ben again. Um, so my question is directed towards it's Christina. Christina. Um, so how does the, like I asked before, how does the curriculum uh, when you're part of the stipule program um, differ um, from the general like MS student, like, are you taking added classes? Are you? I, I know you mentioned the six month like investigative project, but like what else is there that yeah, that you're I, doing? I think the biggest difference is the general MS program takes an investigative class, a mandatory investigative class for seven weeks or so, and then when you're in the investigative track, you have that class for the duration of your time here, 
Um, and then I think that's the main difference there. And then what was the other part of your question? Um, no, that was it. I mean, I was just ask, yeah. asking about how like the CBL program differs mm -hmm. from the MS program. So if okay. that, yeah, I mean, there's yeah. the six month like investigative project you were talking about. Yeah. And then there's so also, the general, yeah. I'm not sure what the qualifications are for the general MS uh, master's project, but for Stabil, you have to uncover what the program describes as a wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. um, and there are very sp particular requirements that Sheila Cornell, the head of the program, asked for, but um, a wrongdoing is something that you absolutely have to uncover or something along those lines throughout your investigative project. And I would also just say for people who might be interested in investigative, is that real need to uncover wrongdoing and expose wrongdoing and challenge public officials um, to keep them on the straight and narrow is, you know, that is something that you have to want to do as a journalist. You know, there are lots of other different types of journalism that you can do, um, but really, if you want to be an investigative journalist, you've got to have that sense really at your core. Journalism in general is always looking at the truth and that sort of thing, but as you heard also from our faculty panelists, there are lots of different types of journalism that you can be doing. And so you want to think about that as you're thinking about your application, whether the MS, whether the MA, which um, specialization or concentration might be most appropriate for you. Uh, hi, my question is uh, for Matt. Um, I was wondering if you talked to me a little bit about uh, how the data MS uh, kind of gets to the human stories behind the data? Um, is there a focus on going out and talking to people, or are you like behind the computer the whole time? So that was one of my worries, too. Um, the thing I like about journalism is, is talking to people. Um, <clears throat> and so it seems sort of antithetical, but they, there's, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, going out and finding the people. Uh, in the beginning, in the first, uh, I'd say, eight weeks, you were locked in this room, I think, six days a week for like eight hours at a time you won't talk to anyone who isn't right next to you. Um, but then after that, you immediately get thrown into the court system, and, uh, I, or at least that's how the reporting class was for us. I was up in the Bronx courthouse uh, one or two days a week, chasing lawyers down the hall, talking to murder victims, moms, and whether you like it or not, talking to humans. Uh, and then coming back and having the understanding of being able to go into uh, open data NYC and pull out like, oh, here are the conviction rates of these different crimes and to add context to that humanity that we found. Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I am gonna stop right there unless there are any other questions. My colleagues and I will be here. I'm going to just say very briefly thank you to our students and alumni. Um, our, th our students are one of the reasons that I work here. So um, we always have, in my very biased opinion, the best students. Um, and so I want to say thank you to all of you. I know you've got very busy schedules. Um, some of them might still be around if you have individual questions that you want to ask, they'll be in the back. I'm going to say two things about admissions and scholarships, which we really haven't gotten to in the program. One, pay attention to the deadlines. If you're going to become a journalist, pay attention to the deadlines. I'm not a journalist. I always have problems with deadlines. Um, pay attention to the deadlines both for the admissions application as well as the scholarship applications. The admissions applications, basic applications, you've done this before. Um, think about it as a story that you are telling and reporting about yourself. Um, think about the different components as pieces of that story. Recommenders, no family, uh, recommenders should be people who have supervised your work and know you well. What do I mean by supervised your work? They either wrote your performance appraisals or they gave you a grade in class. That's usually what it means. 
If you have any questions about any part of the application, whether it is recommenders, whether it is the type of work samples that you should take, um, whether it is whether you must take the TOEFL or the IELTS, if you come from a non-English speaking university, um, please get in touch with us directly about your individual situation. Um, we will also, as I said, be here. I also actually wanted to invite my colleague Ross Yelsey to stand up for those of you especially who are interested in the MA program. Ross is an admissions staff member who is a graduate of the MA program, so he's here also to answer those types of questions. Scholarships, apply, apply, apply. Begin your financial planning now, is that right? <laughs> the J School has generous scholarships, apply for them. I can't consider you unless you submit the scholarship application, which is a little bit different from other schools. Um, we have a scholarship application that helps us match which admitted students qualify for scholarships. We have scholarships for all sorts of things, for data, for people who do community newspapers, for people from Oregon, people from Ohio, people from Washington, D.C. Um, I even had a scholarship previously for people who came from the former Austro, from countries that made up the former Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, there are scholarships for everything, apply for them. Also begin doing your own research, figure out where there is outside funding. We've got a big spreadsheet on the website in the um, financial aid and scholarship section. Make use of that spreadsheet. We've done the research ahead for you. But think about who you are yourself and where there might be money that pertains to who you are. What do I mean by that? I had a student two years ago who brought $10,000 and the check arrived, it was from a uh, re retirement residence. And I said, why am I getting money from a retirement residence? That the people who lived there had decided that they were going to fund scholarships for the children of people who worked there. The only way you know that is because your parent worked there or because you worked there. Um, so think about it in that way. Um, but do start your funding search now, graduate school is expensive, it always has been. I'm afraid that it always will be. Um, and again, if you have individual questions, please ask us. Again, all of you, thank you very much. I thank all of you who have come in person, all of the people who are here on the video. Um, and I'm not sure whether we actually got the live stream started yet, but um, thank you all. And we look forward to reading your applications. Thanks.